Welcome back. It's time for chapter 16, The Electric Field of Distributed Charges. The uh, first thing we need to figure out is what the heck is a distributed charge? It just means that somebody's come along and spread the charge out over some surface or throughout some volume. For example, you could spread charge over some kind of a line or a cylinder. You could spread charge around a ring. You could spread charge on a disk. And obviously there's an infinite number of shapes and things that you could spread charge around, but um, we're only going to focus on four basic shapes. These three, and plus the spherical shape. Let's start with the ring. Now, I want to apologize at the beginning before we get going, because there are some confusions in the podcast I, I already know, and I don't have time to redo all the slides. The issue is this. Uh, in the old edition of the book, sometimes they used X, sometimes they... Uh, use Z for the distance away from the thing, whatever the thing is. And I swiped some diagrams from the old edition, and, and the new edition is slightly different. And so I've got the Zs and the Xs mixed up a little bit a couple of places. I'll try to point it out. I hope it's not too confusing. Uh, but there, I've apologized. I hope it's okay. Let me know if you are confused. I think the ring's okay. Um, the idea is you want to calculate the electric field along the axis of a ring a distance z from the ring's center. The way you do it is to add up the electric field contributions from each of the point charges that make up the ring. Now, the idea is that the, uh, the point charge located uh, sort of a little above the uh, uh, center of the ring along the, uh, I guess it's mostly in the y direction, a little bit in the x direction in the diagram there, uh, produces an electric field that points along the R direction, and it points in the R, exactly in the R hat direction, and uh, its magnitude is given by a uh, the regular old uh, dQ over R squared times 1 over 4 pi E0. It's just the point charge formula for electric field. But because of the symmetry of the ring, you can see that the x and y components of the electric field contributions are going to add up to zero by the time you add up all the contributions all the way around the ring. And the reason for that is when you're in the plus x direction on the ring, the electric field has a negative x component. But when you're in the minus x direction on the ring, the electric field contribution has a positive y component. And basically, those two components cancel each other out. So in the end, you only get the z component of the electric field. And uh, the z component is just the magnitude times the cosine of phi, where phi is the angle that r makes with the, uh, with the axis. Now, you can see the cosine of that angle is just z over r. So if you plug that in, re realizing that uh, r has a magnitude of big R squared plus z squared square root, you get that the z component of e goes like z divided by r cubed. Well, that's the square root of r squared plus z squared cubed, and that's the and that gives you the thing to the three halves there. So that's where that expression comes from. That's the electric field uh, along the axis of a ring. And notice we switch from dq to q because the integral of dq is just q. The, everything else is constant. The phi is constant, r is constant, z is constant. So the addition of all the z components of electric field is a trivial addition in this case. So let's look at that formula and think about how it behaves. If you imagine moving along the axis of the ring, you can see that for small values of z, you get nothing. And the reason is the uh, z component of the delta e goes to zero if you're in the center of the ring. Um, but when you add up all the contributions, you get zero because of the symmetry. But as you move away from the ring along the axis, the electric field goes up, it reaches some maximum value, and then it starts to drop off. It, it goes up at first because the z upstairs gets bigger as you move away, and downstairs z is so small that r, r is the only thing that matters. But as you get further and further away, um, the z becomes more important in the denominator, and it starts to overwhelm the r squared, and then you end up with a 1 over z squared dependence. It looks like a point charge, in other words, so you get uh, 1 over z squared. And uh, if you imagine what that field looks like in space, it... Uh, it points away from the ring in both directions, and it has a maximum, uh, some distance from the ring. I guess it's around the radius of the ring or so. 
um, and then it gets smaller as you move away. So that's, that's how the single loop hula hoop of charge or ring of charge works. I'd say the next level of complication is if you have a, a rod of charge or a line of charge. And here's where it gets a little confusing with the, uh, with the Z's and the X's. I'll, I'll explain that in a second. But uh, first, let's just look at the symmetry of the electric field. If you, if you look at the electric field from above, it always points away from the rod, and it gets weaker as you move away from the rod. So you can see the electric field vectors are a little smaller to the right and a little bigger as you get, uh, as you get closer to the rod. I should, they get smaller the further away you are from the rod is all it is. If you think about how you break a rod up into chunks, you can imagine breaking them into chunks of size delta y. Now here in this diagram, there's an x. Later on, I'm going to be using z, so just hold on to your hats. Um, and the, uh, the coordinates of the field point, the point where you want to know the field, are x and y0. y0 is the distance from the center of the rod where you want to know the field. If you were going to use a computer to do the calculation, you could, you could start with a diagram like this and uh, calculate the r vector as um, the, the field point vector minus the uh, dq, the vector that points to where dq is. So that's the 0, y, 0 vector. Uh, if you happen to be in the middle of the rod, if you're calculating the field at the center of the rod, which is what we're going to do here in a minute analytically, you get a special benefit because the y components of the field are going to cancel if you are at the very center. And that's just because at the very center, and only at the very center, the contribution from the charges above and the contribution from the charges below have y components that are opposite, and so they cancel. The only component that survives is the component that points away from the rod, which uh, in this case could be x or z, depending on exactly where you are. And uh, here I say EX, that was from when I was doing the X direction. Later on, you'll see EZ, that's if you ro rotate around 90 degrees and, and do the Z direction. It's the same either way. It doesn't really make any difference, but it's just it's potentially confusing. I made a little uh, simulation or, or a vPython script that shows how the electric field contributions from different parts of the rod varied at a certain point in space. This is not along the axis, this is not along the midpoint, but it just gives you an idea of how those different DE vectors are going to add up. If you actually go in and add those vectors together as in vPython as a vector sum, you get a net resultant vector that looks something like that. It sort of points vaguely away from the from the rod and it has a, because it's not on the midpoint, it has a kind of a upward direction. But uh, that, just to give you an idea of how you could do this using the computer. If we actually do the sum, um, we'd want to write it out kind of like Coulomb's law, delta Q over R squared. But uh, if we go to the midpoint and we know that only the X component counts, I have, I'm using the X component in this slide, um, we'd have to multiply the magnitude dq over r squared times 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 by the cosine of theta. This is just like the situation with the ring, except now it shows up in the rod. We need to take only the one component of the electric field that actually survives the sum. Um, we're going to uh, set it up to do, to do an integral here, and so let's go ahead and write it in integral form. The total electric field is the sum of the electric fields from all the point charges, and that's just dq over r squared times r hat. Now, what does r hat look like? Um, oh, by the way, what is r squared? Now I've switched to z, you can see. So r, the distance away from the rod is going to be called z, and the r, the magnitude of r, is the square root of z squared plus y squared, and the r squared is just z squared plus y squared. Now what's r hat? Uh, r hat is going to be cosine theta minus sine theta. Now, it's a, it's a little confusing here. I've got the cosine theta in the x component in my unit vector, but I guess I really ought to call it the z component. Anyway, um, we're just multiplying one component by cosine theta and the other component by minus sine theta. But the point is, by symmetry, we already know that only the z component is going to survive. So I could just write out the z component and not worry about the y and the uh, x components, and you can see what I end up with is an integral 
with uh, z squared plus y squared to the three halves downstairs. Now, where did the three halves come from? It came from r squared from Coulomb's law, and then there was a z over r from the cosine of theta. And so the product of those two is z over r cubed. Since r is z squared plus y squared, that gives you z squared plus y squared to the three halves. So it's really not that bad. I apologize for the x, z mix-up. But when you do the integral, you can do that integral using uh, trigonometric substitution. You end up with the final result shown at the bottom there. It looks pretty monstrous. The good news is usually we're in a situation where we can use an approximation to that result. We take a limit where uh, z is small, for example. If z is fairly small compared to l, that means you're fairly close to the rod. That means in the square root there, you can forget about the z and just leave the l in. And if you do that, you get an approximate result uh, that the electric field goes like 1 over z. It, it varies in z like uh, the reciprocal. Not, not 1 over z squared, but just 1 over z. On the other hand, if z is much greater than l, then you can forget the l in the square root, and you just get the square root of z squared, which is just z. And in that case, it turns into a, just a Coulomb's law. It's a 1 over z squared. It's just a regular old Coulomb's law result. So that's, that's fairly easy, not too bad. So uh, on to the disk. Now with the disk, uh, I want first to sort of imagine what the electric field is going to look like. You can see, this is from a computer calculation, you can see that the electric field doesn't vary a lot with position, but as you move closer to the edges of the disk, it, it gets components uh, parallel to the shape of the disk. But if you're at the center of the disk, the field is directly away from the disk. We're going to do most of our calculations near the center of the disk. We're going to deal with what, what it looks like there. And uh, you can see that it only has a z component near the center of the disk. And we're going to divide the disk up into rings. See, since we've already worked out the electric field from a ring, then uh, we can get the electric field from a disk by breaking the charge on the disk up into individual rings. That's kind of an, a nice trick. Uh, let's go ahead and see how that works out. So actually, I, I went ahead and uh, I've got all the equations hitting you at once, so I, sh I should have uh, had them come in one at a time, but let's just look at, cast our attention up at the top of the page. Um, you can see that's the electric field from a ring. I just swiped the electric field from a ring and stuck it up there. dq is the charge on the ring, but the charge on the ring is just the charge on the whole disk times the fractional area of the ring compared to the area of the whole disk. In other words, the fraction of charge in the ring is just proportional to the area of the ring. If I plug that into my DEZ from the ring and simplify, I get a monstrous looking thing, which is uh, looks like a constant stuff times r dr over z squared plus r squared to the 3 halves. It's a little bit like the line, but instead of dr upstairs, I've got an r dr. And and that means uh, the result is a little different. You can use a u substitution to sort that one out. And uh, when you're done with the integral, you get the result at the bottom of the page. It's also a little bit uh, nasty to look at. It's kind of complicated. Again, we're going to only deal with that in uh, certain limits. So uh, actually, I should go ahead and put the limits. Oh, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> OK. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm having to throw this thing together too quickly, and I don't have the order of the uh, uh, appearances quite right, but let's just talk about the equations and move on. Um, at the top of the page, you've got the electric field from uh, the disk, the whole thing. But look at what happens if z is much less than r. If z is much less than r, you can forget about the z in the square root, and you end up with just 1 minus z over r in the square brackets. Um, that's a much simpler expression. It just says that the electric field at the surface of the disk is Q divided by A, the surface charge area density, the, the density of charge on the surface per unit area, divided by twice epsilon zero. And, it, and then it drops as you move away uh, proportional to Z over R. So if you're very much closer than R, it drops off linearly as you move away from the from the surface of the disk. Uh, 
Now, if z is much, much, much less than r, then the z over r becomes negligible, and you just get a constant. It's just the surface charge density divided by twice epsilon zero. On the other hand, you can see if z is much, much greater than r, then you re it returns to the point charge formula. It's just the charge of a point. So those are the three limits we're going to end up using um, most often. Okay, finally, let's talk a little bit about spheres again. Obviously, a sphere is extremely symmetrical. The electric field always ends up pointing away from the sphere. And uh, there's a magical result. I think we've talked about this before. If you're outside a spherically symmetric distribution of charge, it turns out the electric field is just the field of a point charge. So all you need to know, it's quite simple, the, even if you've got a volume charge density or a, a collection of shells of charge density or whatever, as long as it's got spherical symmetry, the electric field outside the distribution always just looks like a point charge field where the charge is just the total charge in the entire distribution inside your current radius. If you're inside the shell, if it's a shell of charge and you're inside, there's no charge inside, it's just all outside you, the electric field is exactly zero. So that's a, that's a simple one to remember. Let's use an example of a uniform density sphere. In other words, a spherical charge distribution where the, where the volume density is constant. There's a homework problem that deals with this. In fact, the figure, the, the back of this figure is... Uh, is from that homework problem. But imagine I've got a spherical distribution of charge, and I'm a distance r from the center. So the, the dark circle represents my distance from the center of the sphere, and the light blue circle represents the whole charge distribution. So I'm a distance little r from the center, and the sphere has a radius of big R. So the only charge that contributes to the field at my location is the charge inside the little sphere with a radius little r. So I want to calculate that. Well, that's just the density of charge times the volume of the little sphere, 4 thirds pi r cubed. But what's the density of charge? Well, it's the total charge divided by the volume of the big sphere. It's the charge per unit volume in the big sphere. Well, that's the total charge divided by 4 thirds pi big r cubed. But notice the 4 thirds pi's cancel, and you get that the charge inside my sphere is just the total charge times the ratio little r to big R cubed. That's a particularly simple result. If I put that back in to the uh, Coulomb's law, that the electric field at my position is the enclosed charge only divided by r squared times 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, I get that the electric field is proportional to the distance from the center of the sphere. It's q little r divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 big R cubed. So that's actually uh, a very simple result. And you'll find that uh, easy, easy to use for the homework. At, at any time you've got a spherical distribution of charge, it's easy to divide the charge up into two pieces, the piece inside your current distance from the center and the rest that's outside. And of course, the part that's outside doesn't contribute. And the part that's inside just looks like a point charge. So that's all there is to distributions of charges and how the formulas that we're going to be using in this chapter come to be. Enjoy.